for being part of Indodata Week. Great, great, thank you. Um, no, this is quite exciting for me. Anytime I get an opportunity to talk to people who could use technology or innovation or adjust uh, entrepreneurship and hard work to, to solve any climate problem, I'm very happy to speak. I think this is maybe beyond climate and impact generally. But climate is increasingly becoming a big focus of, of a lot of um, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, first time entrepreneurs in this part of the world, where you can achieve something good at the same time as having a self-sustainable business. And this is a new phenomenon. When I started 20 years ago, we didn't have as much opportunities, or at least support, I should say, uh, as today. So I think everyone should definitely take advantage of what like what Parvati and team is doing with Indo Data Week to bring um, um, uh, uh, entrepreneurs to to um, stakeholders to in these master classes, etc. So this is um, quite exciting for me. I'm going to share. Uh, I'm going to do a very quick introduction. I'm going to try to do this in 10 minutes. Then I'm going to talk about um, two areas where in our programs we see that a lot of technical entrepreneurs can really focus especially in early stages to, to move their startup forward. And it's the area that already mentioned from the last masterclass. How do you communicate uh, um, your technical solutions you know, to, a, to a customer? We're gonna look at uh, two, two, two modules. One is called customer value proposition, CVP. And there's a second one we call the deal, which is specific to um, one of the programs I run called Climate Launchpad here in India. Uh, and it's really, uh, how do you talk, tell someone what you're doing? That's not so easy as it sounds in innovation or impact, right? Uh, I, I've, I've, I also have the same problem. For example, um, I may talk about uh, um, what I'm doing, why I'm doing something, what impact, and the other person five minutes later can be just as confused as when they started off, partially because of our excitement, partially because of our passion, partially also because we, we um, uh, are not used to getting quality feedback. So I hope this masterclass helps in particular on, on that aspect. Let me share my screen first, a very quick introduction and a little facts about climate tech in particular, uh, which is I think a big area for where data and uh, um, uh, climate can, can coincide. If you're in an area of data that's not related to climate, but some other impact area, uh, I think the same um, lessons that we can learn today apply as well. So as um, uh, Parvati mentioned, um, sorry, one second. Um, as Parvati mentioned, we run this foundation called Climate Collective, a Section 8 nonprofit focus on supporting entrepreneurs in, in climate in India, Sri Lanka, Maldives, as well as the rest of South Asia to Peru partners, right? What we look like is a three-stage accelerator set. Climate Ready uh, is a pre-accelerator. And these are all post-incubation. We use the term incubation to largely mean product development. Uh, and the acceleration is early stage market acceleration, which means customer validation and, re and entering the market for the first time. So we have three accelerators, Climate Ready. We have our big program, Climate Launchpad. I do hope if uh, you got everyone here checks, checks it out for next year. We run it every year. Last year, we had um, 250 startups in Climate Launchpad in our programs in, in South Asia. This year, I think in South Asia, it was quite large too, 150, uh, slightly reduced because of COVID, but it's, a, it's, it's, it's enough space for everyone. And we run a follow-on accelerator called Climate Runway for those who are reaching beyond maybe early sales to starting to get to growth. And we're about to launch our fund called uh, Climate Seeds in March for, for um, pre-series A, 75 lakh to one two CR into climate tech startups. Um, very quickly again, uh, we work with a lot of big groups. Uh, climate Kick is the European Union's leading initiative. Uh, New Energy Nexus, we're in New Energy Nexus India in clean energy. Um, we uh, have been supporting clean energy startups since 2005. Some others, uh, 400 startups have joined our program in the last three years. 
So I'm just going to share with you a very quick overview of what the environment looks like then before we get to the master class. Climate change and impact areas are intimidating, right? Um, uh, sometimes we feel hopeless. Sometimes we feel that, uh, um, you know, the system is against us or, or people don't care. It's all true, right? I do go by this, this line, nothing great has ever been achieved without hope. It's a St. Augustine is an early fourth century church father, something like that. Uh, we do need innovation you know, uh, in climate and in, in impact areas. It's not just money. We need money. We need strong leaders. Um, we need better policy, but as well innovation. And just to share with you something about climate and innovation, even if our current mature technologies we expand out, the, the, a significant portion of technology doesn't exist today, about 40, 30 to 40 percent, um, for us to reach net, net zero emissions by 2070. Right? And if we want 2050, which is what we need, and a larger amount of ex solutions don't exist. So we're at a stage where we need innovation for climate in all impact areas. It's very similar dynamics outside of climate. And maybe I'll share one small thing about climate tech. Now, AI ML has been a very hot area since the uh, last 10 years for especially startups and especially in venture capital. Um, I think uh, um, last year, I don't know the exact number, but some something like 20 to $25 billion went into AI ML startups around the world from venture capital, right? Climate is also getting quite big. There's there uh, today, sorry, um, as of last year, 43 unicorns in climate, meaning there are scalable business models as well. And some of these use uh, uh, data. For example, the, the first well-known climate startup was uh, that, that had a, was a unicorn was perhaps Climate Corp, which is a uh, startup in the US that used uh, weather and climate change modeling to help sell agricultural policies to farmers in the US. Monsanto bought them out for a billion dollars, I think seven years ago. Um, we have others you know, in, in uh, climate that you, uh, we all know about, uh, although 43 is a large number. Tesla came out of a garage you know, uh, 15, 17 years ago, whenever it came out, I forget, right? So, uh, startups like Beyond Burger, which are now being carried by, uh, I think, uh, McDonald's, uh, and there's, there's, there's quite a bit. Right? Last year, $16 billion went into climate tech. That's, that's, that's to give you a sense for how, how, um, how much support there is on the funding side for uh, climate. And because VC World, Venture Capital World, already is predisposed to supporting AI ML startups in particular, Right, because the capex costs are very low, the amount of investment needed is low compared to something like heavy machinery or heavy machines, and the speed to market is very fast. It's a favored path, favored uh, startup type for a lot of at least venture um, uh, startups. Doesn't mean that uh, anything else is not attractive. It just means for specifically the VC world. And maybe I'll share. Um, sorry. In this case, we have, you have startups like the Amazon $2 billion climate fund, which made its first announcement today, actually. Microsoft's $1 billion uh, climate fund. Uh, Unilever has $1 billion for, I think, their internal business, plastics, packaging, et cetera. So this is an exciting time, for sure, uh, uh, for generally impact and investment in startups, and in particular in my space in climate, which I think I would hazard a guess a significant portion of, of this audience probably has, has use cases or applications from what you're designing, developing, or thinking about um, uh, in your business. I, okay, so that's a little bit about me. That's a, uh, well, about what we do. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur for the last 20 years. Uh, I'm a typical entrepreneur. You know, the typical entrepreneur is not WhatsApp, 18 months, start to finish, exit, and retire. A typical entrepreneur is start, fail, start, fail, start, and, and something like that, right? So I think uh, a lot of our media uh, talks about entrepreneurship in, in such glowing um, terms, but only focusing on some sometimes the most exciting cases. 
and sometimes the most uh, dramatic rise of startups. But in fact, um, if you talk to entrepreneurs, many of them have had years of failure leading up to success today, and that is a more typical path. So I do hope you enjoy this path. Uh, it's not an easy one, for sure. Pratap, Deva have a question? Yeah. Hi, Pratap. Yeah, hi. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's very encouraging to, you know, know about these opportunities. Uh, so one thing that I wanted to ask you is that, uh, you know, the, uh, the phrase, you know, a climate tech startup, uh, you know, what is climate tech and what is not climate tech? I mean, I, uh, I've been working in the clean energy space for a long time now, right? And um, especially, you know, distributed energy resources, et cetera. And, uh, and I was looking at some numbers, I think it was in 2017 or 2018, uh, $11 trillion went into in investing, uh, investment and about $60 billion went to impact investing. Right. So one of the problems that, that there are two questions, actually, you know, what is considered uh, climate tech and what is not climate tech? That is the first question. And uh, second question is, um, uh, you know, uh, is there enough, um, you know, financial support for a company that is um, working on the, you know, climate change mitigation? Because like, you know, uh, so for instance, if it is a weather uh, forecasting and weather modeling, et cetera, they, they, they are more interested because it affects the logistics. Because if I'm able to do, I used to work for IBM research. And right. so, you know, if you are able to predict whether Amazon is able to decide when to send the next shipment of goods kind of thing, but it is not exactly climate change mitigation per se. So I just mm -hmm. wanted to get your advice on because I mean, without capital, the, the startups suffer a lot. And uh, yeah, I mean, like people are willing to invest in Tinder, uh, but not in climate change. I think. So that's what I wanted to get your advice on that. Sure, sure. These are all great questions, uh, especially in the, the technology startup world in particular. Not always, but uh, uh, capital is, is, is a necessity or getting access to capital. Climate tech is a wide phrase, some, you know, and okay, uh, we use it. Um, we use it in an accelerator recently called the D3 Accelerator. That's a joint venture between New Energy Nexus and Rocky Mountain Institute. Global Accelerator, it's, it's of course your clean energy startups, renewables, EVs, energy efficiency. It's your carbon tech, right? Uh, yeah, we use climate tech in the wider, you know, wider from waste to energy on the circularity side sustainable consumption, for example, solving problems of, um, you know, like Levi's has a challenge of, I think, making 100% recyclable jeans, you know, from recyclable materials. It's widely defined. Having said that, in my, in my courses or my uh, training, I always talk about Ola and Uber as one of our big circular economy startups, you know, because what do they do? They reuse existing stock for a purpose, reducing the demand for new cars. That sounds circular to me. In practice, a non-climate tech investor would support um, Ola Uber, you know, as they have, not call themselves a climate tech investor. So the 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 first thing is there are traditional areas, you know, waste, energy, you know, um, carbon uh, carbon. That's normally climate tech. The more important question is, um, are is there capital that's coming in to support specifically climate tech? Right. Now, India is a little bit less, but we always lag in capital, but it's coming here super fast. Um, pick a trend, it's always higher outside of India first. And that's, that's generally true of Europe to the US as well. Europe lags beyond US as well, so it's not a strange thing. $16 billion went into climate tech last year, and that doesn't include the corporate venture, one six billion. And that's 6% of all global flows. There are categories that don't get this the venture capital. So it's already one of the big areas and where it's only increasing, not decreasing. Now, I think in India, we get 2% of flows at so 300 million or 400 million. And, and here in India, as well as globally, uh, mobility gets a big share. That's, that's it. So it's a little distorted by mobility, but mobility takes a lot of capital generally. Uh, so to, to answer your question, is there capital coming in? I mean, um, we work with a group, for example, called Circulate Capital in Singapore. 
the $105 million multi-corporate venture arm of like, you know, like the uh, FMCG companies, Levers, B&G, Pepsi. Uh, they, they made their first investments in India already, Series A in waste, right? We do have um, uh, people uh, investing also in, in, as I mentioned, EVs uh, in particular. Um, and, and this is a general rule, Dave. I mean, there's never enough capital. That's, that's the nature of capital, you know? So that's, that's not the question. It's we're moving well, in the right direction. Yeah, yeah. So, no, no, two, two things I'm saying. I don't want to hijack your session. Maybe we can take it offline if you want. Uh, you know, I know you might be running out of time, so I will stop here. But I have more questions. Uh, can I ping you offline and ask you some questions later? Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, for everyone here, I'm on LinkedIn with my all my details as well. Okay. Um, but great. Uh, my team, my, the theme is that it's actually moving super fast uh, in terms of support for um, climate tech from an investment point of view, as well as support generally. Corporates, you know, uh, uh, have big venture capital arms that are looking at startups in India as well, not just independent funders. So now, how do we convince an investor? It's secondary to how do we convince a client, right? right. So let's let's look at. Uh, I have a. I don't. I. I'm assuming everyone here is an early stage of product development. They don't have sales yet. They're probably. Uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but. So you don't have sales, but you you have an idea. You worked on the development, and you you may have some either lab tests or some working on some from from some lab data, but not real life tests. Or maybe you have a pilot already. Right? So now, how do we? Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna start with a module called customer value proposition. Let me share my screen. Let's see. And let me increase the size of the screen. I think you can see now my screen full size. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Great, thank you. So I just have my other slides. By the way, um, here's what a nice, this is our format, nice nine slide deck looks like. Right? You don't need a lot of slides to convince anyone uh, of your idea. You know that saying of putting your idea on the back of a, a napkin and selling it or raising capital, it's, it's true. So what is customer value proposition, right? You know, and, and all three of these words actually are, are pretty important. Um, and normally a, a little more interactive in my sessions, but I'm afraid of a little bit of time. I'll just kind of um, maybe ask questions a little bit later. Uh, value, you know, we know what value is, or we have some sense of the value whether we talk about it in technical terms, speed, right? In uh, financial terms, that cost, right? Now, uh, so, okay, and when that's specific to each startup, the, the more important ones are customer, right? I am trying to sell a solar solution. I used to be a solar developer, a solar solution that'll save the customer some money from, from the higher grid costs, right? Or, their, or maybe their backup DG set diesel generator, right? Customer, in this case, they purchase the, the uh, uh, operations team at a big company says, I don't care. All I want to make sure is that no one calls me on the weekend saying your solar panel doesn't work. I want reliability. Now, if you're gonna sell to that customer, you're not selling on cost, which you think is, right? You have to go to the customer side and understand what is the driver for them. It's reliability, it's reliability. This is where a lot of research needs to come in. So in our programs, once you're first going to a client, to the market, it's really a lot of customer interviews and reducing our preconceived notions. I've had my own problems with this. I used to sell solar on, on, on savings. You know, It wasn't savings that was, at least in the er er earlier days, 2011, 12, 13, that people cared about. It was, does it work, reliability. And I could not get this. Right, there's 50,000 megawatts of solar in the ground, and and I saw. I said, okay, savings for high cost customers. They were worried about technology. I wasn't. So one thing about a customer value proposition is make sure you understand it from the customer side, and we'll look at that. The third most important thing is proposition. A CVP is a marketing term, right? 
uh, it means that uh, it's not my, you know, I will save you, you know, 20% or 20 rupees. It is, I will save you more than somebody else. I will help you sell more than somebody else. So remember that this is not a technical term, it's a marketing term, right? Uh, yeah. One good test to know if a CVP is, is successful is if it works, right? There's no theory that's, you know, there's an old joke about economists, you know, when they were told something about uh, some data in some country on some, you know, macroeconomic contraction. The economist said, uh, it works in practice, but does it work in theory? It's pretty, I'm an economist by training too, so it's a pretty funny joke. CDP is similar. If it works, it works. If it doesn't work, you change it as much as possible, that, and, uh, as long as you can deliver that value. Okay, we we'll won't get into this. I wanna give an example that I wanna ask you some questions. This is, uh, we'll get into this in the next session. Uh, Snowcom is one of our climate launchpad startups. Okay, they sell snow removal machines called snow cubers to airports, right? And the airports uh, buy it for 200,000 euro per machine, right? This is what it looks like, by the way. It's very pretty, nice colors. And you can see the, the, uh, the action of picking up the snow, up this chute, and then into a truck, pretty efficient. If I asked you without knowing Anything else about snow, um, snow calm or snow keepers? What is what? Would it, what are some of the potential customer value proposition CVPs we could use to sell the clients? Anybody want to hazard a guess? We know what the machine does, right? It's up snow. I guess as a cubing function. Makes into cubes, or right? I should I assume they be compact. How can they sell this to a customer? We know the customer is an airport. Uh, you uh, just a second, brother. Like people are sending messages to me. Oh. You can also send it to the chat, so you don't have to message me. You can just choose everyone, and then uh, you can message. Yeah. So and ideally, can... just just uh, unmute. It's okay. In fact, uh, this is a good exercise. Uh, I have this um, general rule. Uh, what I've seen in my life, twenty years as an entrepreneur, uh, amongst friends of mine, the same startup takes six months or five years. The same startup, and the difference is someone is afraid. The the, the one who launches in six months is not afraid of being wrong looking uh, ill-informed you know it's a very emotional process startup you know i've had so many startup ideas where people say that is the dumbest thing you don't understand anything right even in solar they told me india will never go to solar yeah you know, I, you know india is solar now but back then it's you know we have so much coal it's cheaper uh, all my ideas you have resistance so it's okay to to hazard a guess um just unmute your thing. All right, uh, maybe I can uh, unfortunately ask you since you are on, uh, Dave, are you there? Uh, yeah, the some messages like I can read out, but I don't know why they are messaging me instead of in the group, but time taken to remove snow is less. Right, yeah. time taking to remove snow, okay. Anything else? Any messages? Yeah, this is the, uh, there are two or three who says the same. And Deva, it says you would like to ask a question. Uh, is it like from now? Hello? No, that, that is many of them say the same. So time taken to remove snow is less. Right, right. So time taken to okay. Um, uh, uh, in the old in the old days, and the old days means pre-COVID when we didn't do this online, it would be much much harder <laughs> to be in a master class. Uh, I used to have this rule that uh, whoever I can't do it here because no one's screens on, but uh, whoever looks down when I ask a question, normally I ask them to respond. 
And that is only because we, you know, getting over this fear, like as I mentioned, of, of uh, taking a chance, you know, being wrong, it's okay. The time taking to remove the snow is less. In other master classes, I've heard people say maybe it's safer, you know, from a, a for for the uh, workers. Uh, maybe the machine costs less, right? It's all power. Right. Some I can see some messages now. Less manpower resources. Yeah. Less manpower resources. These are all good. Yeah. Right. Now the interesting thing though is. Uh, what, what's the best way to to sell to a client, right? What is, in this case, in the airport, what is the customer, in this case, the person maybe purchasing or operations, someone, what are they going to do? They're going to go back to their boss, committee, other department and say, here's what I heard, right? And they're going to use specific language, right? And that, you're going to, for example, if you, if you mentioned time to take snow is less, right? How, what will they do internally inside the organization? They're going to say, well, here's the cost of the machine. Here's the time to take, right? How do airports make money? Anyone? At least with respect to airplanes. I don't think I have the chat here, or at least public chat. Anyone, okay. how do airports make money? Can you see the chat, uh, Pratap? Yeah, actually, I can. Uh, it has, yeah. Yeah. Anyone ever, anyone want to hazard a guess how airports make money? Number, Number of land landings and takeoffs. Parking fees, great. Uh, yeah. Shops, yes, yes, for sure. I think significant. And in the case of snow, at least, uh, yeah, it's a number of landings and takeoff. If you can't land or take off, you don't get your landing fee or takeoff fee. Now, when they go back and calculate, you know, hey, this person's snow calm has come to me, their machine takes less. That's a technical viewpoint of value. The value from a business, the viewpoint of a business is profit. So let me show you a, uh, what a deck, what it looks like. Internally, they'll come back, right? And they say, do this, do this analysis for me. If we take this snow cuber, right? Whatever that costs, it could be more expensive, right? Probably is more expensive, by the way. And it could be, but it leads us to higher landing fees or takeoff fees. As a whole, how much more money do we make, right? Versus what I'm doing right now. And in this case, uh, snow cuber is 20% more profits to the um, uh, airport. It could be 100% more expensive. That is not material. It's the profits because you have to combine efficiency plus cost and other factors together. This is a language, especially in particular of business, is translating away from your product. My, you know, uh, I can I can either do these calculations in this amount of time. I can do uh, here's the range of data I can give you. Right. That is not how business works. They work on profits. And this is a challenge, right? You have to think deeper from the uh, uh, customer's point of view. If your machine, if your analysis works so fast, but they have a two week turnaround time because it goes through their, their organization, your speed doesn't matter to them, right? That you can do it instantaneously. They may not be able to react instantaneously. So to be able to do a CVP that's powerful, especially for business, is to think what business cares about. And it is almost, almost always Profits. In fact, in Planet Launchpad, what we what we say is, as a general rule, is business and government, they don't care about the climate or impact. Right? It is not something that we see. We see business use CSR funds for climate, but not their operational budget. So, if you want to get operational budget, meaning selling to them, put it in the language of profit. So. Going back to B2B is business to business, meaning you're selling to a corporate or a company. If you lower their costs, let's say our machine is cheaper than tractor and plow, but same efficiency. That's normally pretty straightforward, right? Better quality, right? This is, this is not really a data kind of for, for data startups, but it's, it's, it's informative anyway. If you are selling something 
to a customer to so that their their products are better quality why it is a corporate care it sounds you know we hear the language of quality best quality 100 percent guaranteed it, the, these are marketing languages in reality people sell to different segments at different quality so if you're selling on on the act of increasing the quality of their output products or or, or solutions it has to lead to higher profits again not quality in and of itself other way you can come from if you're using solutions that reduce capital investment uh, by reusing equipment by taking the equipment off their books of course that that could also lead to higher profits i don't think most cases we see data solutions that are b2c business to consumer right but we never rule out anything here uh, especially as the world is changing when you sell to a consumer, you have much more flexibility beyond costs and profits. I won't get into this much. I want to share with you what a high quality CVP document looks like. Slide, uh, as you, uh, if you haven't already created a slide, this is a uh, climate launchpad startup called um, uh, V Chiller. Uh, they sell to beverage manufacturers. They reduce the cost of electricity bills per fridge by 1,000 euro, right? Which is uh, two thirds less than existing current current fridges in their beat in their targeted market for beverage manufacturers. Pretty simple, right? Now I want to show you another slide here, and this is a more interesting one. We had a startup in another area called um, Leafy, or actually Avlodia. They took. Um, fallen coconut leaves in Kerala and using a simple steaming process and some uh, women empowerment businesses uh, locally, they created biodegradable straws. And their straws are, are cheaper than paper straws, other things like, you know, growing bamboo, edible straws, et cetera. Now, the interesting thing is look at their CVP slide. They're selling to Domino's, you know, big, F uh, big chains, right? They're selling on cost, you know, with very little, except on the right, just a little bit. They're not mentioning impact on climate. They're not mentioning uh, women empowerment. These are all important things, both for them and maybe for the company as well. But their CVP doesn't work for the for their those operational teams. For example, at um, uh, Jubilant, which runs Domino's franchise in India. There, Jubilant is looking for a low-cost biodegrade alternative to plastic straws on cost, right? You can't convince someone to buy something on a CVP that you want, right? It's customer value proposition. Now, this is hard to do, right? Um, when, when Normally, when, when startups come to us, what we often see is a CVP slide that has five, six, seven aspects impacts you know like in this case you know uh the impact of uh waste on the ground it's actually bad to leave your coconut leaves on the ground anyway um uh, uh, women empowerment village economies benefit we normally see something like that right and maybe maybe it makes us feel good but remember cvp is always about selling if it doesn't work it doesn't work and oftentimes i'm not saying always because every startup is is unique and they make their own choices. Normally picking the one CVP or maybe one or two that is in consonance with your customer, right? Is the way to sell it. And customer segments may differ. Maybe Avlodia is selling to Jubilant Foodworks on cost, but maybe they're selling to a big foundation that's supporting a uh, transition to straws on women empowerment. Or, you know, so your CVP is not fixed to your business, it's fixed to your customer segment, right? So we just we just have to make sure that as we're listening to customers, doing as many customer interviews as possible, um, uh, we don't be rigid about CVP and think about the most important thing is uh, what works. These are some other slides, some examples where uh, um, oftentimes innovation leads to changes in, in cost structures. Right, in this case, grass block uh, versus you know uh, typical um, asphalt uh, uh, roads, etc. They have a different um, 
from their uh, innovation, their maintenance costs are next to nothing, but their CapEx costs, upfront costs are higher, right? So we use tools like total cost of ownership, right? But these are things I won't get into because this is something you can, you can figure out how to present, but this is simple. Um, I'm not gonna, okay. So that's a, a very short um, kind of um, um, look at customer value proposition, right? There's a lot here that I didn't cover. You know, we do, you know, normally an accelerator takes, you know, ours is about three to four months. We do a lot of uh, refinement, right? You go and create a CVP, go to the market, they come back, you get, you get feedback, uh, and you keep changing it until it works. Uh, and you know it works because people are starting to either, you get the next stages of, of, of um, the sales cycle or someone's buying, as simple as that. Maybe I'll stop here quickly and just ask a few questions. Um, um, I don't know actually everyone's background here. Has anyone here at, sold or attempted to sell to customers already with what they're working on? or at least discussed with customers? It's okay if you haven't, early stage. Or maybe I could ask you, Parvati, uh, uh, just the background of everyone here, is it, is it still at the product development stage? Yes, many of them are, are still at the product development phase. Uh, if I look at right. the name, but maybe there are one or two who already have uh, product Yes, in product development phase, yeah. So mo right. mostly them, and we have some participants from our hackathon as well. So they are still in the ideation phase, yeah. Right, right, right. No, and uh, that's 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 okay. Apart from economic, can we calculate some social or environmental proposition? That's good. That's a question from Vignesh. Uh, what you mean is a, uh, a monetary quantification. Apart from that, whether other CVPs. This is a uh, this is uh, this is a question that that's a good question actually. It's the heart of what we talk about for CVP. If a CVP works, use it. If a environmental proposition, environment or or social proposition works, use it. Right. That's that's for sure. What we have seen though is if you are selling to business, now this is a strange thing coming from an impact program, that uh, if impact doesn't sell so well. In, I'm not saying it's a hard rule, right? You may show, for example, impact and it may help them sell, but think about the way corporates are designed. They often have an operations team and they have a either CSR or support team, right? If the operations team cares about bottom line and almost all, uh, most do, what will your environment or social impact proposition do for you? Right. You may think, you know, I will do an economic quantification, but as well, I'll do a social. Okay. There's an old theory from uh, advertising came out, I think, in the 80s called positioning theory. Right. And, uh, and I'm going to use that to kind of explain how, how people work. Positioning theory is this idea that people remember in a specific product category, one, two, or at most three, maybe, very few number of brands that work. If I want, um, if I want a refreshing post tennis match, athletic soft drink, I go to um, uh, I go to uh, myself Sprite, right? I'm kind of influenced by all the in the, the sleeves globally uh, when I grew up. Sprite attached to um, uh, as athletics, refreshing, etc. But it doesn't matter, right? They use their entire focus on, on, on positioning Sprite to solve it thirst, or Mountain Dew in particular for thirst, right? And the idea is that people can't remember many things, right? The reason why I buy Dove soap, Dove is, uh, is whenever I go to a doctor and I have an allergy or my kids have an allergy, they recommend Dove or Cetaphil, right? So I remember Cetaphil as a soap for, hey, if there's an allergy, so there's no sense, et cetera. As simple as that. I'm sure Citavel has a many other amazing benefits, maybe about how it's made, many things. But in my mind, I just remember one. Now, the same way, especially for organizations, there'd normally be something like internally, hey, can, <coughs> excuse me, can we solve this? Here's what I'm looking for, a jubilant thing. I see the world changing to plastic-free. 
can we find a uh, straw, right? That is biodegradable, or at least alternative to plastic. Uh, and I can, what's the lowest cost straw out there, right? That is something that's done internally through discussions for days, weeks, months, maybe even years before they come and look in the market. Right? So you won't change that, right? It's, it's, it's that built-in kind of uh, framework for them, what they're looking for. And when you come to them, hey, I have a great straw and as women empowerment is huge, they will not bring that back internally to operations, right? While another organization may be, let's say Olam, one. Olam works with a lot of farmers around the world. Uh, but they're the second biggest, I think, private trader in the world. They may be looking for a solution that has village impact from an operations team because they work with a lot of villages for procurement. So they're saying maybe we can we find straws that, that uh, really support local villages as well. I come to you and say, I've created these straws out of Zurich, right? It is cheaper than anything else. It does not satisfy Olam's needs. Right, all I'm isn't saying they want the cheapest in the world. Obviously, cost is an important thing. They're trying to solve something else. So that's why, to some degree, to answer your question, yes and no. Yes, uh, in my in my opinion, if uh, you think it's useful, and yes, if it aligns with your target customer segment. And if it doesn't, I don't know. I mean, uh, I wouldn't do it because you know that person she or he will go back to our team and only focus on the CVP angle that they care about, right? So in that sense, uh, knowing your customer helps to make this, this, this decision. That's a good question though. Okay. Uh, anyone else have any questions here about CVP? Any challenges people are facing about CVP? Right. So do make sure, especially when we come to data and we're solving a problem, it does go to a uh, bottom line, right? When we talk about, for example, farmers in India, especially in India with marginal farm or small farmers, right? Single person farmer. They are as much a business as, as a large commercial farmer, right? It's not the size. That farmer, she is looking to make money, right? So whenever you're selling to farmers, even there, you have to think, treat them as a as a business. Maybe one last thing I'm going to share is that my wife used to work at Mastercard and product development, and what they used to do is they used to spend one to two years talking to customers, understanding need, defining a new solution that they're you know in product development. Once that was clear, customer finds value. These are the attributes they want. These are the ones that I don't care about. This is how uh, um, position it, the CVP is a positioning or a marketing tool, so it, it can sell easily. Once that's understood, then they build it, which is the opposite of most of us as startups. We don't have the resources of MasterCard to be able to afford that because we need to build, we don't have the credibility maybe, we don't have the customer relationships. But it is a good insight, even if you're in product development, what I would suggest is not waiting too long to talk to customers even before you finish. They will tell you what they're looking for, why, if it's important, or if it's not. Great. Any anything else? Okay, good. Uh, Parvati, uh, I think I have fifteen more minutes or ten for the next uh, uh, module before I go to any other questions. Sure, you can have a like. Let's take a break then. Yeah, we we'll take a five minute break. These are always long sessions being yeah, in front yeah. of a computer. So I have 12 of four, so 12, 10, we'll be back. Yeah. Super. Can you hear us? Yes, yes, hi, great. Okay, okay good, welcome back. Yeah, but now that we're all virtual and so much of what we do, we gotta take as many breaks as possible. Um, great, I think we have 10 minutes. Uh, 10, 15 minutes to look at another uh, module that's, that I think could be very interesting at this stage, early stage of product development as you're talking to more people. Uh, this is called, we use the term, the deal. Right? Uh, when I uh, talk to a lot of entrepreneurs in early stage, what happens is innovation is just starting. 
the ideas are being formulated. The ideas are also getting rejected and refined and there's a lot of um, uh, changes happening on a real time basis. And sometimes as a result, explaining to others what we do is challenging. In fact, uh, I've, I've, I've been interrupted as well, but I've seen people tell others what they're doing and one minute later, it's still not understand what your startup does. We often talk about impact, we often talk about technology, but not necessarily, well, are you selling something? Are you partnering, et cetera? So let me share my screen. If I can find this, great. Share the, um, and I can also mention that this also takes time and practice, but it's worth it. Uh, general rule I use as an entrepreneur is that Especially after this phase, a huge portion of your time is spent selling. Not just the customers, you're selling to investors, of course, you're selling to your own teammates because they need to understand what's going on because there will be changes. You're selling to new employees to convince them to join your small startup and take that risk with you. There is risk, of course, in startups. So learning how to communicate, uh, uh, especially the idea, is worth the time and effort. So when we say the deal, what we're talking about is a, what is the market translation of what you do? Meaning, what do you sell? Who buys it? Right. It, it talks less about impact. It talks, there's no talk, discussion so much about technology. That can come later. In fact, I find this very useful is that when I tell someone uh, what I'm doing, first I start with what I'm selling. Right. Then talk about how I do it. So instead of talking about technology or why it's important for the world, why, why am I Here's some example. Then we use a simple structure. It literally is these two boxes and two arrows, kind of, right? The startup sells this product to, to this customer at this price. That's it. And what I feel that, is, uh, that when I see this, I should say, it, this helps create a framework when you're talking to a potential customer or a potential partner. We sell this data solution that reduces the uh, uh, amount of fertilizer used in the field to large commercial farmers at price of, sub subscription price of X rupees per month. Once you have that framework done by, by this deal, it's clear. You're selling a monthly subscription to data to help them reduce fertilizer usage and you're targeting large customers. So I don't come back to you, to you and say, oh, what about the marginal farmer, right? You've already told me that you're focusing on large farmers. Uh, I don't come back and tell you, well, how much does the software cost to buy? You're not selling it to me on a, the software, you're selling me a subscription, you know, uh, um, um, uh, business model, okay? We want to look at this. So I'll give you some examples of what, how uh, useful or what these uh, deals structures look like. Okay, these are all climate launchpad structures. Startups, sorry. Warm up sells composter uh, composters to consumers at a price of 300 euro per composter. Normally in data, we don't see this, but okay, because normally uh, you know, these are physical goods, but this is simple B2C business to consumer product deal, okay? When you're leasing something, like leasing uh, access to a database, Solis uh, rents solar panels to private home owners, private home owners, at 55 euro per month. Pretty simple again, right? We're not, we're, they're not selling the panels, not selling to shopping malls, and they tell me the price. I'll get to price in a bit. Uh, if you use a intermediary like uh, a Barsha pump is, is 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 actually this this little pump uh, Amsterdam I think company uh, focusing actually on Nepalese farmers. Akista sells Barsha pumps to farmers through farmers collectives at a price of thousand euro per pump, and after the margin to their farmers collective they receive seven fifty euro. Right. So what we're trying to do is share very clearly, not what's the technology, not uh, why it's important, what's the impact of it first, what is it you're selling? Just tell me that so I have a framework when you tell me more about technology and impact. 
It's a very powerful single sentence, one sentence. Now is when we start getting into data, right? I normally do it in a different way, but uh, because of time, you know, Angry Birds, you know, uh, we may have all been um, users of Angry Birds, right? A company called Rovio. Rovio, in one way they make money is by downloads. Rovio sells Angry Birds to consumers through an app store at some price to Europe or app. And after they commission one, 1.4 Europe or app. Now, the interesting thing here is, especially when it comes to data, is we make sure that when we talk about customer, we're not talking, if customer is someone who pays. I've used Angry Birds for many years. I'm not a customer of Angry Birds, right? And Rovio has never received um, a rupee from me. I'm still a use user, but not a customer. And what we see oftentimes in data business models is the user may differ from the customer, right? You'll see this oftentimes with public goods, uh, public uh, uh, governments buying this for, for example, an air pollution data set uh, or app where the users are citizens, but we don't buy it, right? But the customer uh, in this case is the, let's say the government, right? So that distinction, let's make sure we're clear of when we do our business models. We'll get to this. Maybe a, another interesting example is uh, when it comes to data is Google, right? Google search engine. Now, uh, Google search engine, we've all used, right? I'm out pretty much everyone on this planet, or at least in this room, have all used. Are we customers? Right. And normally, this is where this is where a lot of confusion comes in. I haven't paid Google yet for their search engine. In fact, I've used it several times this morning. Google.com typed in my search, got my value, meaning my search results. I didn't. I didn't use a credit card. I don't. I'm not on a subscription plan, etc. So, in fact, what Google Google's business model is actually selling data about us. We become <laughs> Google's product, they sell it to companies like Vodafone, for example, right? Maybe they have a uh, search listing, you know, those that, that, that list at the very beginning of a search that's paid for uh, listings, or maybe it's a click, you know, advertising, you know, on, on a Google search page, uh, search results. Vodafone pays Google for data about us, our consumer behavior. Like for example, we clicked on this or we searched for that for a price of X per click to, to Europe or whatever, X number of clicks. Now Vodafone takes that data, right? And they sell iPhones. That's their business model. So this is an input for them. So this is where we start to get a little, little more interesting examples when we think about data. Oftentimes a user, again, like the previous one, the user is, is uh, you're only a cons customer if you give money right? Otherwise you're a user, right? If you're using the data or the application, et cetera. If you're using, um, if, if sometimes in this case, the, by interacting with the app or the, or the solution, that data is monetized by the company to sell to an actual customer, someone who pays. So we become, we help create the data or the product for the customer. Maybe I'll give you another last example that's kind of fun as well. And this is very cool to think about data and business models because sometimes they're quite shocking. So Ola and Uber are, are, are these taxi. I've, I've used both of them extensively. Um, now, if I ask the question, you know, uh, what does o, uh, Ola or Uber provide? Right? Okay, aren't they a taxi company? Or a taxi hailing company. I don't know. You know, they do they partner with taxis in some way, etc. Again, it's it's confusing until we look at it in detail and these questions of customers versus user users, and this question of are the is the customer data our interaction with with a company or a startup? Do we become the product? And here's one way of looking at Ola and Uber, right? leaving aside that there are some, sometimes in different markets for Ola and Uber, it does differ, but Ola doesn't own taxis generally. 
they have an app, right? The taxi company, the taxi owner that gives us a taxi ride, right? Now what Ola does or Uber does is they tell the taxi company, Pratap is sitting here at this coordinate, wanting him to go there. He will take this size car and he will pay this price, right? So Uber collects that data, sells it to the taxi company, right? Now, Uber does two things and Ola does two things in certain cases. They also collect the money if you're, if you're paying through the app, right? On behalf of the taxi company, right? And you can see that the, you know, so where the confusion comes because sometimes when we think we're paying Uber, we think that's the person providing the service, but in this case, they're just collecting money for the service provider. So again, there's a lot of complexity and very interesting innovation when it comes to using data in this case, working with existing companies that can't use data in the same way. And I'm sure in, uh, from this uh, hackathon and this group here, there's gonna be a lot of innovation of how to use data for impact that requires this kind of innovation of business models. I find this one in particular very exciting when you think about Uber and Ola and, and what they are. Um, Maybe a last example uh, is uh, a company called Nerdalize. They realize something about data farms. They generate heat and it's a cost to keep them cool. They also realize that uh, where they are in Northern Europe, a lot of people buy heat because it's cold. So they try to figure out, well, you know what? Could I take that heat right from a data farm, sell it to a second customer? So this is what, an example of what we call a two-sided market from the same process. It's not two products that are just put together, but two-sided market is from the same process or product. There's two value streams that are created. And oftentimes we, we see a lot of innovation that comes from this act of, uh, uh, of using other value that people can't monetize and finding the customer. And that often can happen in data as well, data startups. Okay. I think the rest is a little bit more specific to um, our specific accelerator, those slides, but uh, maybe to summarize at least this um, aspect, you know, to be able to tell someone what you're selling to whom at what price both takes time, right? Two, not easy to do as it seems, even to describe your product in a short phrase, right? Takes iterations. The best way you can tell if it works is test it, right? Test your, uh, in this case, deal with, with 10 people. See if they understand it. They don't need to know everything about it. They don't need to know technology impact, et cetera. They need to understand, okay, you're selling me a subscription for uh, uh, helping farmers reduce fertilizer usage. That's, that's enough for giving some of a framework uh, uh, to set up the rest of the year your discussion of your startup and how it works or what impact or how you sell it. So that, that's sort of uh, the, I think the two things that during product development that could be very useful to start working on, CVP, because um, without CVP, all you have is technology. And you can start talking to customers even now. And then as you, especially as this progress, this progresses, the deal or something like that, how to succinctly tell someone what actually you're selling, not what impact, not what technology or other coolness, what you're selling to whom, right? And that, which we call the deal in, in the Climate Launchpad program. So yeah, um, I'm sure um, if there are any questions, I'm, I'm more than happy. If you want to reach out to, to uh, to uh, um, us as Cli Climate Collective, um, uh, check out our, our website. We're pretty active on social media as well. We, we are running challenges all the time. And in fact, a key area for us is data and, and climate change and data and circularity. Those are two, I think next year, we're gonna launch uh, incubators in our case. Um, yeah, yeah, Parvati, I, I hope that this was, useful at this stage for the, uh, the cohort here.